Hello, everyone, on the conference from the Global Meeting of Horaces, and thank you very much for Frank-Jürgen Richter uh, for uh, organizing this very important conference uh, with global participation to tackle global issues, and I would argue in a time that is really challenging from different angles. And um, I'm really honored to chair this uh, panel and uh, before we start and go into the topic of uh, basically looking at enhancing black swan resistance, we will dive deep into the different views from the gentlemen uh, on this um, panel. I would like to uh, introduce uh, of the gentlemen on the panel, but I prefer always that they do it by themselves. So um, I would suggest that we start with uh, Greg, please. Sure. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm in Hong Kong and have spent many years traveling around Asia. And uh, my background is predominantly in various types of insurance uh, and insurance startups. Uh, but apart from that, I'm sort of doing some angel investing now, and I have have my own corporate services and trust company, uh, qualified as a lawyer, and so. Uh, um, looking forward to talking about black swans today. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I would suggest also, please, it's a technical thing. Uh, I don't know from whom, but if you could mute in your back, that would be great when you are, when you are not speaking. Um, Chitesh. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Jitesh Shetty. I'm a technology entrepreneur. I've started a set of companies and sold. Currently, I'm a co-founder, CEO of a supply chain tech company called Infini Chains, which is headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, before <clears> this, <throat> I started a cloud configuration education tech company called Quick Labs, uh, which I sold to Google in 2016. Uh, I've spent uh, close to 20 years uh, in, uh, in, the, in the U.S., mostly in Silicon Valley, building early stage products and scaling uh, those products and those businesses. Right. Uh, very, very excited to be here. Thank you, Chitesh. Um, Klaas? Yeah, hello, uh, everybody. My name is Klaas Neumann. I'm joining you from China, which is also the place where I live since 10, 10 years. I work for SAP. <coughs> um, I run our global R&D centers. Uh, in, this is a global role. We have these centers in about uh, 17 different countries. And uh, before living in China, which is about now for a decade that I'm here, I, I lived in uh, India also for about 12 years. So my career has happened mostly at SAP and also overwhelmingly in Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now from Asia, we go to Europe. Uh, good morning, Sator. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tupac Martyr. I am <coughs> artist at Sator Studio. Uh, mainly working across uh, live entertainment, uh, architectural lighting, and immersive technologies. And uh, myself, um, my name is Matthias Ernst. I'm the founder and CEO of Essentia Futura International. I'm also currently in Lisbon. Our company is in the United States. We have two business lines. One is we, I'm a senior fellow from the Family Firm Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, we have a practice on uh, governance, family advisory for entrepreneur families globally, entrepreneur uh, with impact on society. And uh, besides that, we have our own participation business, private equity, what we do for our family also globally, also with the aim of an impact on society with all that what we do. Okay, gentlemen, enhancing black swan resistance. Um, when you look at the topic and, and the audience, you will see certain buzzwords of uncertainty, war, pandemic, um, supply chains uh, disrupting, globalization, all these buzzwords right now also in, in, the, in the news. Well, there are no buzzwords, they are real. And uh, the reality is now to see how to deal with them on a very pragmatic basis and then for me, it would be interesting to understand from each of you in really short, but as a message, how do you see the world today based on that background? And then we will go the next step to see, okay, how can we 
as leaders in certain areas and fields and with experience, how can we then address those issues and what decisions or what strategic thinking is needed to mitigate risks and all the consequences with it and uh, have this really hopefully on a positive note that we can change things if we are smart enough and stick and work together. Now, uh, I would uh, say let's start with class. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matthias. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, it's a broad question and not so easy to, to uh, answer this now extremely brief. But if you ask me about my, my opinion about uh, how at stage are we in terms of Black Swan events? I mean, I live in China, right, where, where about two years and three months ago, one of the major Black Swan events uh, of this uh, recent past has started, right, uh, with the uh, pandemic in Wuhan. And we are now we are again facing major disruptions in the, let's say, after quakes of this <laughs> pandemic or the way uh, the strategy is executed here. Yeah? And uh, these, these are all really unforeseeable, to some extent, unforeseeable uh, events where uh, companies as well as individuals are struggling quite a bit um, to cope with. Yeah? Um, so that's, that's one. And I mean, you see, whereas in, in the country where I come from in, in Germany today, uh, if you are COVID positive, you are, um, just stay home for five days. You don't even need to test when you go out again. Uh, I'm now here on my 20th day in a quarantine as a completely healthy man. Right. <laughs> so it's also, uh, it's, so it's a very different way how to do this. I don't even want to judge whether this is right or wrong or what's the better strategy. I'm just saying it's so different, right? And it can also be very uh, disruptive in its own right. Um, I see from a digital point of view um, that we are, of course, uh, seeing probably more a more risk risky environment around us. We have seen this also uh, if we look to the uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia uh, conflict, that immediately also the, the cyber attacks have uh, increased. Uh, so we see multiple, I think, risk scenarios in front of us uh, on the digital side, on further decoupling between areas, blocks of countries. And all of this uh, leads me really to the conclusion that, uh, of course, we cannot just, what can I say, uh, give up. But we need to be extremely diligent, uh, having the right scenarios for a huge uh, number of uh, yeah, options in front of us and also create the ability to react along of those scenarios. And I would leave it with that. I know we are discussing a bit more on this uh, in a second or so. On. Thank you very much. So, uh, Chitesh, please. Sure. Uh, so we are still in in the middle of the of the pandemic based on uh, which uh, country you're in in the world uh, and i think one thing that is difficult is uh, the end of this is unclear when is uh, the world going to return to some kind of a normalcy uh, the second is based on what business you are in uh, the impact of at least the pandemic let's keep the ukraine war aside the impact of the pandemic really differs I believe that if you're in a very software business, right, digital business, largely uh, the pandemic has been uh, a forcing function to increase adoption. Uh, we see that across the board with SaaS companies, even consumer companies, it has led to uh, more adoption of those products and uh, those businesses have done well. If you're someone that is reliant on what I think of as a fragmented supply chain, the impact is huge, right? The impact both to current disruption, but also in terms of uh, uh, uncertainty, right? How do I rewire my supply chain for the next like two years, five years, right? Uh, uh, is, is very, very hard. Uh, both in kind of very basic things like uh, garments to more kind of sophisticated things like specialty chemicals, uh, because uh, supply chain investments are high capex investments. And uh, those investments uh, to, to make that right, you know, uh, the uncertainty is very, very high. And uh, I think uh, one of the things that this is teaching everyone, especially at a board level, decision making level, 
is uh, how important agility is you know and what does agility really mean especially in terms of like capital allocation what does that mean what does that mean in terms of people and third uh, what does that mean in terms of how do you think of digital right those three things are really getting kind of uh, 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 the definition of that right is is getting really uh, uh, redefined in a big way so i'll stop there and uh, uh, proceed thank you so sorry yeah it's interesting obviously as, as as you're mentioning you know the the idea that software in certain industries are actually not softly affected whereas you know i come from from the live industry from uh, from the arts industry from culture and we were completely forgotten by just about every single government in the world you know we are the we were one of the first industries to shut up and we're probably one of the last industries to come back <laughs> And the amount of regulations and elements that were put in place in front of us have been really, really difficult. And in many cases, uh, the, the money that was uh, there and available for uh, to survive actually never arrived to us. Um, for some reason, culture has always been seen in entertainment, so it's been seen as something that the bourgeois uses, even though it's something that is there for everybody. And at the same time, we are completely forgotten by governments. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing to, to, to observe. Thank you, Satan. Greg. Thanks. It's interesting <clears throat> that we're uh, uh, talking effectively about things that are happening or have happened in the last couple of years. In other words, we're talking about known black swan events. But are they actually black swan events? So we look at the pandemic We know that under George W. Bush, not one of my favorite presidents, but I have to give him great credit here, that he set up a specific department which was designed to avoid another pandemic. Barack Obama continued that work, and it was under Donald Trump that it was disbanded. So if we do look at any type of event like this, we can sort of to some extent mitigate it. Maybe we can't get rid of it. We can to some extent mitigate it. When we talk about the war in Ukraine, as all of you know, uh, the US kept saying that they were going to actually invade. They were going to attack. It wasn't poo-pooed, but it just wasn't followed. And in particular, in Ukraine, they didn't follow it. So when we get black swan events, Are we really uh, thinking about them in advance? And are we really prepared to stand by the sort of things that leaders are doing? Because one of the questions we have is what do leaders do about it? And so when you have a change of leadership or you have various leaderships that come into, the, into play in these situations, um, then you don't necessarily get the action that you want, which would in some way, mitigate against a black swan event. So um, if, I can, if I can now sort of position it a little bit differently, um, can we think about what else may be a black swan event? I know that's, that's very difficult for us to think about what may be a black swan event, but I think we can have a go here at, at a few of them. And, uh, and actually, I, I have a... Uh, I have an acronym, which is called MYSELF, M-Y-S-E-L-F. Um, and, and this uh, this is an area that that uh, I've looked at uh, from various aspects. So the, the MYSELF stands for me, you, in other words, all of us. And SELF is sustainability, E is education, L is logistics, and F is food security. So uh, perhaps in this particular forum, I can just talk a little bit later on about the food security aspect and how one thing there can lead to another. Well, uh, thanks everyone for, for, for the comments. What I would like to stress as a next step from that, what you just said, if, we, if I extract some of the things, so we have the regulator in the different countries of the world and how they address problems that affect their country, some more, some less, some are strategically 
in a, in a, in a serious problem when we basically when it comes down to climate change, flooding, etc., things that can happen. And on the other hand, we have the entrepreneurs that can go cross border, which is not that easy sometimes for politicians, but they can do trade, they can do businesses uh, to the extent it's obviously internationally allowed. But they can also be a bridge. Um, and when we have problems that affect the planet, affect the global community, you need to address them differently and you need to have the stakeholders working together differently than ne not necessarily for all the businesses. And when I hear what Chitesh said and class implicitly, that the IT industry haven't been that affected. It, well, it is affected by events like the pandemic and others, but not that much like others, like Satoru mentioned. So it is really the situation that we can say, how can regulators, how can the businesses, more affected, less affected, but all we have, we have employees, the, the people, the goods, the supply chain. How can we work together and how can we address these issues in different ways? Big issues normally are addressed by philanthropy, global summits, leadership by management, by the state. But for the leadership, who has to take the helmet? Is it a bigger solution or are there small steps to reach the solution? So ultimately, how can we address that when we take a war? How do you tackle the climate change that is known? And then later, following up on that, what Greg said, when these things happen with all the consequences of it, what could be potential effects that we see, known unknowns, but maybe also that we could envision a really bad strategically that we even don't know right now. So how can we address from an issue standpoint, stakeholder management, regulators, businesses, so that we can really make a change or bring it into a different direction for the benefit of all of us? I would like to start with Chitesh, please. Sure. So I think uh, you need to bring agility in a few areas. I'll speak as a business what you can do, right? That's uh, uh, my area of expertise. So you need to bring agility in a few areas and you need to invest long term in a few areas, right? One is on the agility side, I think it's people, customers, opportunistic investments and cost, right? In those four areas, how do you be agile, right? How do you really manage a uh, uh, your people and provide support in an event like this, you know, in a very quick turnaround way, especially if you have a global business, how do you manage your cost structure very quickly? Third, how do you be opportunistic about allocation of capital? If there are, what are the interesting opportunities uh, that are available? And fourth is how do you kind of uh, uh, serve your customers uh, who have been disrupted, right? How do you bring agility in all these four areas, right? You also need to figure out a way to long term invest in people around culture, mental health and just health overall. And I think there's a huge uh, underlying thing happening, movement happening around this, right? That, you know, how do you provide support in your business or organization to people and, and invest more long term in this right around around people? So I think uh, agility has been spoken about over years, but now we are seriously seeing even traditional businesses like manufacturing supply chain really kind of uh, get, uh, figure out a way how do you get this into your dna right how do you be more agile especially touching those uh, four buckets thank you so sorry from a totally different industry uh, how would you do that and the question here also on the culture culture has different aspects because you could tackle things from the from politics to business, you're free thinking on that, what you want to show with your art to the world. And uh, so if you have a look at that, because it's a different perspective as instead of uh, from the politics, politician side or from the from, from the entrepreneurial side, um, because you have a different aspect on top on it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> culture is a big, big word. You know, um, I, I remember sitting with the European Union talking about what does culture mean? And we ended up with a board that was humongous about, you know, 
the original concept of what culture means to what that means to every single person. I think that the, the interesting thing that comes in is and something that pandemic has showed us. We see that many, many times, but pandemic has actually accelerated this in, in the eyes of everybody. Anytime there's cuts on any budget, the first budget to be cut usually tends to be from the arts and the culture and those elements, those subsidies. And so obviously when all this happened, who was the first people to be get cut? Completely, it was us. So we actually need to have a lobby uh, and, and understand ways that we can actually interact with the government. So they understand the amount of people that are employed in these industries. Um, I think it gets completely overlooked because it is such a, a freelancers and you know day-to-day -day kind of job where people work on on different things all the time. Doesn't mean that big corporations actually have um, the, the the majority of what is going on, and and that leaves us be exposed to to how we can actually. Uh, have these conversations with, with, with the government, have these conversations with our local politicians, um, because everyone deep down inside knows that what we do is, is humongously important. Let's be honest, most of everybody that's it, it's here survived because they were able to watch television um, and the programs that were being provided and you know, your normal platforms. And all of that is culture. All of that is art. Um, and all of that is people having to work. And, and so I think the, the, the things that uh, that annoy me sometimes uh, from from this side of it is we're not capable enough to to get together and, and create this this foundations that we can actually go in and lobby with 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 the government. You know, there's there's plenty of, of moments that when we actually have gotten together and 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 put that pressure, things have come in the right place. You know, there was a, an entire incident in 2018, 19 with a regulation about a lamp that if it had gone into effect. Uh, it would have basically killed 95% of all live entertainment, culture, theater, anything you want to call it. And, you know, thankfully someone flagged it and we were able to, get, to come together as an industry to change that legislation. And so I think that the, the biggest issue that we have, and this is internally our, our problem, we'll say, is we have never been able to put all this into a single uh, lobbying group like everybody else does so that governments can actually look at us. Um, at the same time, I do put and place my finger on every single government that the first thing that they do is cut our budgets and, and see us as, as lesser human beings in many, many occasions, you know, so. <laughs> Thank you, Satori. Um, Greg. Thanks. Uh, people are resistant to change anyway. Unfortunately, it's a human trait that <clears throat> most people are very comfortable in the space that they're in. So I, I often think that sometimes change has to be forced upon people. Uh, you can see it, actually, with authoritarian governments like China, uh, which class would know very well about, where they are able to effect change because they have an ultimate mandate and it can't be resisted. It's sweeping. Uh, but from the industry that, that I'm associated with, we could force change too. So uh, I've just been in Australia, as you know. And what, uh, what we had whilst I was there were massive and unprecedented floods. And there's a particular town called Lismore, which was absolutely flooded to the point where effectively that city, I shouldn't call it a town, it's a small city, um, to some extent ceases to exist. Now, how do you stop something like that from happening again? Because it will repeat itself. So as the insurance industry, what you can do is you can say, all right, uh, you want to live on a floodplain. So if you want to keep living on a floodplain, we're not giving you insurance. So how can you afford to build or rebuild a house when you don't have any insurance cover for your house. So in that respect, it is forcing change. Will it be for the benefit of all? Uh, hard to say, but it certainly means that, uh, that people will have to make choices and they'll have to make sensible choices rather than just lifestyle choices in future. So, uh, I think, I think that, um, if you 
if you're hoping that the people will just naturally change, uh, we'll be waiting a long while. Thanks, Greg. Class. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Matthias. And uh, I, I would agree to what Greg just said uh, that uh, it is it is not. How can I say? It's just an in us self. We, we, we like routine and, and we are not really always open to change. Every one of us, right? And then, of course, also complete societies. Now, how to drive the change, whether the way it's, it's happening here is the best, I, I'm not so sure. But, uh, but I, I think we need to find the right models. Right? And, and um, I think the, the, um, what uh, Tupac said also is, is, uh, and that comes to your question, to your original question. Um, the secret also to have a resilient society uh, to reflect Swan events will indeed be uh, to have all stakeholders uh, uh, having a voice, right? Uh, the culture, yeah? <laughs> the business, the medical, whoever is required, right? Uh, from, from the distance uh, observed, uh, it's sometimes easier because then I could observe, for example, what, what happened in Germany, right? And initially, the COVID crisis was a pure medical thing, right? Nobody spoke to any other stakeholder. Things were passed on to the people. And uh, then, of course, also a lot of resistance has been built because so many people said nobody listens to us here. So I think this is very important. Um, also, of course, that builds on what Jitter said at the beginning, a to use digital technology to the outmost uh, possible would also help. I mean, as long as health authorities among themselves still communicate with Telefax machines, we shouldn't be uh, surprised that there is no database for decisions, etc. Right? And I think the same is, of course, also true for many businesses. Uh, so the more one knows, and of course, under the rules of privacy of individuals, but the more data I have, right, anonymized data is happening yeah, in certain scenarios, the better and the quicker I can also react. And that makes, of course, uh, a multitude of potential black swan events probably better manageable, right? Um, I hope that, that we have learned that lesson also, not only because I'm from that industry, uh, but more because I've seen really the advantages in our customer base, for example, from, from those who were able, for example, to redirect uh, supply chains immediately, who were able to see what can happen where, trace goods that are somewhere on the ocean, and those who were not, yeah, and, and then suffered huge disruptions uh, in that. Thank you, Klaus. Gentlemen, I would like to do the next step on the impact, because what we also uh, need to discuss in the, in the, in the last 15 minutes, um, is how can we impact that? So what we just heard is people don't change. There's a resistance. Sometimes people need to be forced to crack mentioned that, or potentially or not an impact regimes, um, govern certain government structures, uh, governance structures, uh, tend to implement that in different ways. This was also mentioned, but they're all people. So the question is here, how much management is involved and how much leadership is involved? So you have a crisis, you have a really bad crisis, uh, you have a terrible crisis, whatever it is, they're all crises and you need to deal with them on a local level, on a global level, different levels. So you manage them, but it doesn't necessarily mean when you manage them that you solve them or that you strategically solve them. So they will come back, the floods. So they will come back. We will have more wars, potentially. God forbid, no, but it, 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 we cannot say that. So the question is how much leadership is out there strategically that the people follow, that the people see a purpose why to follow that leadership, why to follow that concept by themselves. Because when they, we have... There is a study um, uh, from a German um, big company that said basically from all the concepts, from all the strategic content, only 20% hit the ground. 80% go to the trash can or somewhere else. So this is an astonishing number. For 
So the question is how much management on different levels and how much leadership is out there. And this is the thing, how you would assess the management versus the leadership. And I would like to see more leadership. It could be on the local level, but impacting really the future so that we have it on a positive note. Maybe we go to, we go back class. Uh, thanks, thanks, Matthias. I was just thinking about your question as you were framing it, and um, you know, um, leadership. We, we should not fall into the trap to say um, uh, leadership is always like top down, right? Everybody imagines there is the other leaders, and right. we just follow, right? I mean, there are also many forms of, of uh, other leadership, like self leadership, etc. Um, and where, and I think this is probably the, the, uh, secret in the end to not to make everyone a leader, but to motivate people to take leadership, right. For certain issues, to resolve certain things in their, uh, realm of opportunities and, and influence. And by this, in the end, making also the change. Yeah. I think if we all wait that some miraculous leader, I think Leaders are a representation of our society. They are as average as everybody else. Yeah. And, um, the pluses and minuses. Um, and, and, uh, therefore I believe it's, it's really about more of empowerment and, and, uh, driving those concepts through organizations. Yeah. And, uh, also cons uh, through governments, etc. That's just my initial thought to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's all right. Um, I, I will completely agree with class. I mean, th this is the reason why I think um, our industry is so great because everyone has to bring in from different sides. Yes, you have a director or a show designer or you want to call it, but then the lighting designer, the video designer, the costume designer, everybody has their cells that they bring in with their teams and the way that everything has to work. And, you know, it becomes this this massive way of, of design by not by committee, but by by having different leaderships at the same time move things forward and you know this idea that the grand leader is going to come and give us all the all the answers is completely completely wrong um at the same time you know uh, i'm a big believer um of protopia i'm a big believer that uh computers and software can actually help the way that we live and as you said there's 80 percent of, of of ideas going unused because because maybe they're in the worst place because they are not being utilized in the correct spaces. So the question is, is there a way that we can create a database of ideas of this types of leadership, of this types of programs that can go in and can actually find, the machines can find, oh, wait a second, I wrote about this, but that's wrong for Germany. But actually the elements that you need in order to make that idea happen could be used in India. But the guys in India have no idea that those ideas actually got built in Germany. So is there a way that to create a database of ideas and elements that are needed that can then be used by machine learning and AI to say, actually, the, the, the perfect example of what you're trying to achieve here can be done somewhere else and therefore be able to recycle those ideas so that 20% of those ideas are not wound up being realized, but actually getting into 50, you know, even if it's 1% for every single year. If we went that way, in 30 years, we'll get 50% of those ideas that are being created will be actually delivered. And so I think there's, there's a way in the thing that we have to break away from the molds that we have and utilize all the modern technology that we have available to our hands in order to create new things. Thank you. Chitesh. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think uh, there are a few things I'll share, right? What uh, uh, I think as a, uh, as a leader, as an individual, as someone running a business, and I agree with class, right? It's a very overloaded term leader, but uh, anyone who wants to have an impact, right? One thing I think always is about culture, people, how do you empower, how, how can you be there for your team? Uh, one of the things I've, uh, a change I made a lot is around mental health, how important it is, you know, how do you kind of really uh, make small changes around like, you know, meditation apps, yoga, make that available for free. Uh, I think that is going to become more and more important for us as humans. Like, how do you really uh, be there culturally for people, especially around the mental health piece, right? 
uh, I think uh, I, I think that is one change uh, you can very very uh, strongly you know start making. The second I think a lot, uh, which again uh, in small ways I try to make is that be very careful of where you're getting your information from, you know, and uh, and uh, how do you around your own uh, reach? How do you help people? to differentiate between what is real news what's fake news right especially around the time of a crisis and this is this is someone coming who has worked years in ad tech companies uh, helped to build uh, some of the social media apps but you know i think this is going to become more and more important that uh, uh, really helping folks within your org to differentiate within your family everywhere right this is not real news this is real news and these are some of the sources you can say you get real news from. Thank you, Craig. Um, I'm in agreement with everything that's just been said, I have to say. Uh, I think that another aspect of this is thought leaders. Uh, it's, it's not just empowering people, but actually having a category of people who are your thought leaders. So let's take India right now. And as we've been seeing on the news, India is having a, a super heat wave, especially in the north of India. We know that this has been predicted. We know that it's been because of climate change. Are we seeing any leadership from the Indian government to make a change to do that? Did we see any leadership from the Indian government previously uh, when they had the, uh, the climate meeting? they were one of the holdouts. So are, are, there, are there people who are capable of influencing the leadership there? And, and this is just as an example, uh, because you need those thought leaders who are the ones who can be trusted by a leadership to uh, have their views heard and not only just heard, but have them accepted. And so I just, I don't want to be down on India per se, but, but it provides a very good example of where you can see something happening right now. Um, and, and what we also need are thought leaders who can tell us about what they think might be the next black swan event. We've been discussing what we know about particular events that are happening now, but what are those next black swan events and when we had the discussion in preamble to this we we talked a little bit about how one thing can lead to another for instance as as mentioned before we talked about how in bangladesh the climate is going to cause the sea to sea levels to rise the people are going to have to go somewhere where are they going to go most likely they're going to go to india you have a muslim country going to a Hindu country. Are people thinking about that? Are thought leaders able to influence ahead of the actual event that that happens, that they can, to some extent, mitigate it? So I think uh, it's a very important aspect to this overall uh, thing that we're talking about now. And I, I agree absolutely with what Klaus said. That you, you have to look at a whole lot of leaders, but those leaders have to have a voice and they have to be trusted. To add on that, and for the last five minutes, I would, uh, I would like you to, to focus on, on two aspects. Uh, the first is, we heard from Satori, uh, it could be about something for Germany, it could be better in India, a data back. Um, thought leaders, different areas, different forums, how can, how can we organize that? First, Who's taking the helmet to organize? Right. Uh, how is it organized that it's in a structured manner? Is it wanted by certain governments that certain things are organized? So how do you organize that if you don't have it from the regulatory side or if it's for whatever reason not wanted? And consequently, the interdisciplinary part so that one side that maybe has not directly something to do with a problem but have a different approach a different perspective so that it can enlighten to bring a solution to the table so how do you interconnect it and how do you organize that thinking out of the box 
that we for the future can look at it as a bright future. We managed to get a vaccine as human ma- uh, mankind in a year, which normally takes many, many years. So it works when you when you are in a crisis mode, things get accelerated dramatically. So going back to the beginning, uncertainties, wars, pandemics, black swan events, resistance. So how can we organize ourselves? And if it's a global problem, how can we organize? How can we structure interdisciplinary that we find a solution for those problems that we currently see and also for the unforeseen? Um, Tidesh. Maybe we go to Satori if the unmute is not working. Yeah, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, we can we can sit here and idealize the way that we can actually solve these problems. I think there's there's deep roots in a lot of these issues that unfortunately go beyond a hopeful thinking. Um, I keep having a joke with my friends that you know what we really need is uh, the aliens to finally arrive. You know, because if you know anything about the way that we work is if you live in the same city, then you have a rivalry within the same city and you don't like each other. But then the moment you go somewhere outside of the city, then both of you are from the same city and that joins you together. And then the moment that you go, but you hate someone from the other state, but then you go to another country and now all of a sudden we're both Mexicans. So now we like each other, even though we might be from completely different sides of of the city. And then all of a sudden you come to Europe and all of a sudden we're Latinos. So now we really care about each other because we're from Latin America, you know. And it's, it's one of those moments where you go, do we need someone to come out from the other side and go, OK, so you guys are Martians. We're Earthlings. And so we're going to join together now and we consider ourselves a single industry because finally we see ourselves as one humanity. You know, I think this is a deep rooted problem in, 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 in that, that comes from a lot of the legacies that we have directly, you know, and then you can call it psychosomatic, whatever it is, but the way that our DNA and the way that we believe in it, it, it we actually need to, it, 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 you know, when they say a new world order, we do need a new world order because a lot of the differences that are in our world, you can see them in Brexit, you can see it with um, America and the republics and everything that is happening, you can see it in, 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 in every single country has the same thing. So obviously there's a big division on it. So the first thing that we need to figure out is how do we clear those divisions? Because until we don't clear those divisions, right now we can see them left to right. But in reality, it is left to right, top to bottom, and even freaking diagonal for all I care about. You know, So I think before we do any of this stuff, we need to figure out how do we actually unite ourselves. And you would think that a global pandemic would have, and it did at some points, but it needs to be half something different. Thanks, Atori. Gentlemen, we only have one minute left, so please be brief on that. I'm, I apologize. So, uh, Chitesh, is your mic working now? So then, sum up if you have something. If it's, if you like something, you can you can do it like this. Class, please. Yeah, then super brief. Uh, I believe the institutions which we have, whether it's WHO or United Nations, etc. They are not completely dysfunctional, but they they need serious reforms. I, I'm not a specialist, but whenever I have basically interaction with those organizations, I I realize the huge amount of bureaucracy, etc., that happens here. So I wouldn't throw them all of, out of the window, uh, but somewhere we need to start to reform it to reach the goals which were just mentioned. Also, thanks. Thank you very much, Greg. I see we're over time already. I'm going to say one word, Starlink. So if we think about that, you asked about who's going to take the helm to organize. It's happening for us in ways we don't imagine. Think about what Starlink is going to do about delivering information across the world to places where you need a VPN right now to be able to get that information and think about if you want to talk black swan events, what happens when that is all put in place? I think there's going to be 22,000 satellites in all. When it's all put in place and it happens to be brought down because a particular country doesn't like the information that's there. Yeah, sorry about that. 
so just a couple of things, right? One is uh, I agree with what Klaas said, like global organizations need some kind of a reform and need to be uh, uh, made uh, uh, kind of more tailored for the present world. That's one. Second, I'm a strong believer in the internet and a set of services have to come uh, which provide uh, authentic, validated content, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, what business model brings that blockchain, crypto, anything where uh, ad-driven uh, uh, content uh, goes away, where, you know, you don't need to monetize this uh, through ads, but it is kind of real, authentic, uh, valid content. I think that will make a massive difference. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, it was a very interesting conversation, uh, different aspects, uh, in a very, I think, challenging question and all the consequences out of it. So it was not an easy task. Um, empowerment, leadership, that we organize ourselves and then bring that to the broader community in whatever form. Uh, I would like to leave that on a positive note that uh, at the end of the day, people are smart and when it is that we have a problem and they stick their heads together, I, for myself, Matthias, I'm really positive that we can achieve things that we haven't envisioned before. Well, I thank uh, Horasis for giving us the opportunity to speak. I thank you all on the panel for your time and for your insights. And I wish everyone at the conference uh, more insights from different panels, different uh, outstanding speakers, and I thank everyone on the panel. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It has been a pleasure. Bye bye.